in many ways, I'm here under false pretenses because this is the Faith in Science lecture series, and I'm not a scientist. I'm a mathematician. There are some critical differences. Now, of course, as we all know, mathematics is the queen of the sciences. <laughs> but still, there are some differences. And actually, some of them are relevant to a discussion of faith and, faith and science, because science, you know, people are interested in, in facts and learning actual things about the world, <laughs> not mathematicians. <laughs> We're interested in assumptions. And instead of wanting more, we just want fewer. So it's a little different. And so I don't have any pictures of volcanoes or stars being born or strange animals. You know, I'm, I'm actually going to be talking much more from a literary point of view, and we're going to be looking at, at the wisdom literature, most specifically the wisdom literature in the Bible, although I will, uh, I will mention a few other examples as we go. Um, the period in which the wisdom literature in the Bible specifically was written, I think has has many parallels to some of the things society, particularly Western society, is going through nowadays. And so I wanted to look at, at what we could learn from, from these books, from this writing, from this exploration of the human condition from 2,500 years ago or so. Uh, and see how we could incorporate some of those ideas, more particularly some of those questions, into our own lives nowadays. Um, so, I, I know they said there'd be questions at the end, but if you have a question in the middle, you should probably just ask it at the middle while you remember it, and I have some idea what you're asking about. Uh, because I may not remember what I said by the end, so why should you? Okay, so let's start with the wisdom literature. Classically, we think of there being seven wisdom books in the Bible, or maybe five. It depends on your definition of the Bible. Uh, in the standard Protestant canon, the first five books are there. The book of Job, the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, <coughs> Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs, sometimes known as the Song of Solomon. <coughs> the next two, Wisdom, sometimes called the Wisdom of Solomon, is not in all versions of the Bible. It's what's known, it's part of what's known as the Apocrypha. And so it is more common in Catholic or Episcopal Bibles. Um, and Ecclesiasticus, which is easily confused with Ecclesiastes by the name, but it's even more confusing if you look at its other names because it's also known as the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach. Um, there are some interesting things about Ecclesiasticus, which if I remember them, I'll mention them when we get to them. So those are the seven wisdom books in the, in the Bible plus Apocrypha. Uh, obviously, they're, they're all Old Testament plus the Apocrypha. Um, the wisdom period, well, let's, let's just go on. You, uh, I mean, the first thing I might want to mention is, well, the wisdom literature. 
versus Greek philosophy. Sort of a similar time period, overlapping time period at any rate. Um, but to me at least there are, there are differences when we look at, at the wisdom tradition versus the philosophy tradition of the Greeks. There are certainly, well particularly with the Stoics, there's a lot of overlap. But to some extent the questions and assumptions are different. Um, and this is oversimplifying things by several orders of magnitude. But when we look at some of the early philosophical writings, the question is, where, where does morality come from? Um, it was a time of questioning the, the traditional Greek religion, which was mostly told through stories with the Greek mythology that you all learned back in high school. <laughs> it's true, I am a high school dropout. But I, I, did <laughs> st I did study mythology before I dropped out. Um, so those were stories, that, but they were never intended as anything but stories. But they still were a framework for understanding the world, they were a framework for for understanding why things happened the way they were, they did. They're a framework for understanding where the world came from, where things came from, and to some extent they were a framework for understanding where the rules of a good life came from. But when we get to the philosophers, there was a lot of challenging of those explanations from tradition. And so there was a lot of questioning about where does our sense of morality come from. There's less of this in the wisdom literature. The wisdom literature, to a large extent, assumes a background of tradition. And in the biblical wisdom literature, very specifically a background of the law and the covenants. <coughs> in philosophy, we're looking, people are looking at, what, at what's universal. We have different religious frameworks. We have different societal structures, but what, what's the commonality? What, what are the universal elements of, of a moral existence? Now, of course, that kind of appeals to the mathematician in me, because <laughs> as, as I said, we're trying to, to limit the number of assumptions in mathematics. We want to know what's true whether or not you're in a Bonnock space. Okay. You don't need to know what a Bonnock space is. It's just one of those mathematical things. In fact, the story goes that Bonnock was at a meeting and they were talking about Bonnock spaces and he leaned over to the person next to him and said, what exactly is the definition of a Bonnock space? But, <laughs> so, communication. Not always a mathematician's long suit. Um, <laughs> But in the wisdom literature, and specifically the Jewish wisdom literature, there's not so much a question of universality, but of particularity. Applying wisdom, applying the fear of God, which is a phrase that is very strongly identified with wisdom, as God's chosen people. Now, when we come to more a broader definition of wisdom literature, which there was a lot of wisdom literature in the sort of third through fifth century BCE uh, in the Middle East, it, it was not just the Jewish tradition. 
it, it was really a very common Middle Eastern style of philosophy. But again, it had these different assumptions. It came from an assumption of the tradition. Sorry, am I, am I wandering around too much and getting no, no, out no, of the frame? <laughs> I just feel odd standing in one place and talking. Um, and when we get to more modern, what I will describe as still wisdom literature, it still comes out of sort of, it's based in a specific tradition. It may be more universally applicable, but it comes out of, comes out of those assumptions of sort of a particular tradition. All right, now, just in case it's been a while since you've gone through all these books of the Old Testament, I thought maybe we should, we should review them just a little bit. Um, the, the first one is Job, um, probably written in the 5th century BC, which is quite soon, actually, after the return from exile, the exile to Babylon. So it's, it's post-exilic, but not, not long after. And the story, of course, is Job was, was a good man. God says to Satan, look at my servant Job, what a swell guy. Uh, it's, that's a rough translation. Uh, actually, there will be several quotes in here, and I'm just going to tell you, I didn't pay much attention to which translation I was using. It was whichever one I could come up with online quickly, so I didn't have to type much. So, uh, but Satan says, well, sure he's a swell guy. Look, he's got everything. What would happen if, if not so much? So Job goes through a series of disasters, and his reaction, his coming to terms with that, is sort of the book. Um, the theme I'd like to sort of focus on in this book, uh, I mean, the main theme of the book, is we have a good man, a man who lived a righteous life, a man who did what was expected by the law, by the covenants, by any sense of morality, and yet bad things happen to him. A modern example might be C.S. Lewis's Problem of Pain or um, A Grief Observed. <coughs> Good things happening. <laughs> Wrong. Bad things happening to good people. The other is also true. We have good things happening to bad people, but that's a, that's a different thing. And Job's friends are trying to console him by telling him, well, it's got to be your fault. You must have done something wrong. And we see that same kind of attitude today. We see it when, when we hear about somebody that is suffering from lung cancer. And almost the first thing some people will say is, oh, were they a smoker? I didn't know. Somebody came down with cancer. It must have been something they did. <coughs> now, of course, Partly that's fear. You want to believe that if I don't smoke, mm -hmm. I won't get lung cancer. If I don't eat McDonald's hamburgers, I, I won't get stomach cancer or whatever. You know? <laughs> so partly it's, it's a fear. But still, it's, there's something in human nature that wants to assign the blame because then you don't have to worry about you. And so suffering as a punishment for sin. Now, remember the disciples asking Jesus, 
This man was born blind. Was it, was it his sin? How could it be? He was born blind. Or was it his parents' sin? <laughs> Had to be somebody's sin. The guy was born blind. Suffering isn't supposed to happen to good people. But we see in some of the earliest wisdom literature exactly facing that, that problem, that expectation that isn't met. As we go in on in the book of Job, we find quite a bit of discussion about wisdom. Where, where is wisdom to be found? Can human beings find wisdom on their own? Or is it hidden from us? Is wisdom hidden with God existing but really beyond, beyond our understanding? That's, that's not an attitude that in Western society we tend to be real comfortable with. That wisdom is beyond us. Um, The next book, I'm taking these just in the order in which they appear in the Bible rather than chronologically. Um, <laughs> partly because of Psalms. If I wanted to do them chronologically, Psalms is a problem because Psalms is written over centuries. <laughs> the Psalms probably stretch out over three or four centuries at least. In fact, some of them, I mean, they're called the, the Psalms of David. Some of them probably are. I mean, there's evidence that some of them really do go back to David. But a large number are, again, post-exile. Okay. You might have gathered that I, I'm going to indicate that wisdom literature developed in the post-exilic period for some reasons. And so I'm going to point out that each of these books, each of these seven wisdom books, were at least in part written post-exile. Um, there are several types of, of psalms. Um, some, of them, some of them are from ceremonies. Some of them are songs as people go marching into Jerusalem for various festivals. Some of them are prayers, some of them are thanksgiving, some of them are penitents. And then there are some that are specifically identified as, as wisdom psalms. I list three of them. 119 is another. 119 is that very long one. <coughs> it's groups of eight verses, each starting with a single letter of the Hebrew alphabet mm -hmm. in order. It's a, it's a very elaborate structure. And everyone mentions the law, the covenant, the promise. Um, mm -hmm. so, so it's really looking at that, the law and the covenant. But some of these psalms um, are specifically identified as wisdom psalms, and they are mostly later ones. Um, what do we see explored in the Psalms? Well, there are a lot of them that certainly indicate that right living is supposed to be rewarded. Though the unjust vanish like the grass of the field. We look for the unjust in their places, but they are no more. And some of them are saying, well, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, and so the reward must be later. And that's, some of those attitudes really are, are how we can date some of these, these psalms to different periods. There's not a whole lot of belief in the afterlife until after the exile. It was not an original Jewish idea. It came from contact mm 
with other traditions. Or at least it entered the literature after contact with these other traditions. So, right living, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Again and again, we see that phrase in the wisdom literature, the fear of the Lord. And again, it's one that's, that's not easy for us as 21st century Americans. We don't really like fear. Fear is not a good thing. Fear of the Lord, in fact, to most of us, sounds like a bad thing. Right? God is love. Why would we be afraid? But again and again, we see this idea of the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. Turn from evil. Obey trust. Um, so, the idea of a good life, the idea of a righteous life, as being obedience, as being trusting, comes out in several of these psalms. And then, as I said, the, the wisdom literature being based in, in the law and the covenant and the traditions, we see a lot of praise of the law. The law was what set the Jewish people apart at that time. It was, it was theirs. It was their special covenant. And so it was a very important aspect. Um, just you guys all have these all memorized, but I don't. So, uh, so I'm just going to go through it. a couple of opening verses of, of three of these wisdom songs, just to sort of illustrate the what I'm talking about here about how they're looking at things. So, Psalm one: Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay, we're. We're looking at a people set apart. We're looking at a righteous person. We're looking at somebody who is making a conscious effort to live their life in a way they see as right, in a way that the society sees as right, in a way that the nation sees as right. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's pretty clearly King James, but I can't. I, can't, I, I just grab what I could find easily. Um, so we're seeing the idea of a righteous life. We're seeing the idea of the law. The law and the covenant as setting these people apart. Psalm 19, more of a song of praise. That's right. The heavens declare the glory of God. There are some of these that, you know, you just can't read them without hearing Handel. Uh, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. The heavens are telling the glory of God. And then this one, which is a little more of the... Uh, things don't always work out the way you, the way we really think they ought to. You know, there are evildoers. There are workers of iniquity. Now, this one assures us that they will wither like the green herbs. <coughs> um, but. I think really verse 3 there is more the point when you read the whole song of trust in the Lord and do good. What is it Joel says? What is it that is asked of you? To do good, love, mercy, and walk humbly with your God. All right, next book, Proverbs. Proverbs is kind of a fun book. It's full of little sayings, some of them very deep, and some of them saying, you know, 
wait until everybody has some dinner before you start eating. <laughs> um, the midsection is really not particularly wisdom literature, but the it's sort of bracketed by post-exile writings that qualify. I mean, not just because I've said you got to be post-exile to be wisdom, but if you if you look at those sayings in the middle, they, they really are more just sort of social graces. Um, and the prologue, the first nine chapters, is basically a poem in praise of wisdom. And then the the last section, which is fairly short, but it's it's looking at the righteous life. And then tacked on at the end is a poem in praise of the virtuous wife, which we're not really sure of the date on, um, but it seems to be in, in that later section. What are some of the things we see in Proverbs? Resist evil without turning to evil. Somehow we... We've heard that idea expressed uh, elsewhere than in Proverbs as well. Better a quiet dinner of herbs than a feast in a contentious house. <laughs> and then here, rather than echoing something from Jesus is saying, I would contrast that with some of what we hear nowadays, the sort of gospel of success, that wealth is a sign of God's favor. I don't really find that much in the wisdom literature or in the New Testament. I find it pre-exile in the Old Testament. But the exile was a big change. And righteousness is rewarded. The Proverbs does say that. Job might argue. Job's kids might argue even more, <laughs> since they didn't survive the book. Um, oh, let's see. Do I have more to say about that? No, I guess not. Um, Okay, Ecclesiastes, um, the word is usually translated as the preacher, uh, from the Latin. There are other ways it could be translated, but that seems to be the usual one. Uh, it's pretty late. It's not the latest, but it's, it's fairly late, it's certainly post-exile, it certainly has influence from the stay in Babylon and the writing. And it's not the most cheerful book in the Old Testament. <laughs> vanity, vanity, all is vanity, says the preacher. Um, there's a lot about the futility of life in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, there's a lot of exploring the question of bad things happening to good people. Where is the meaning? It's less pessimistic if you don't read it by picking verses at random. Picking verses at random is a very bad way to read Ecclesiastes. For one thing, there are directly contradicting verses. The, uh, the unrighteous flourish like the bay leaf tree, and the unrighteous will get their comeuppance. There's, 
there's just a whole series of things that if you just read them as isolated verses, it doesn't make any sense. But if you read the book through as a quest for understanding, a quest for wisdom, then I think you see that many of those early what is going on God questions, if not answered, are at least put into a context as you go through the book. Um, It's still not a real cheerful book, uh, I, I gotta say. It, it doesn't really have a happy ending, but it does sort of lead to a notion that wisdom is out there, but in our current state of development, we can't always understand wisdom. All right, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, everything. we got lots of names for these things. There are real questions about how this one got included in the Bible in the first place. <laughs> um, you can stretch a point and say it's an allegory for God's love for his people Israel. It doesn't really read that way. It reads his love songs. It, it's a beautiful piece of poetry, but it really is, it, to me, when I read it, it seems to be exploring human love. Now, I am not a theologian, and I don't even play one on TV, <laughs> but I could point out that if you read the whole the whole book, Song of Songs, there are a few things you're not going to find. Like any mention of God, any mention of the law, any mention of the covenant. <coughs> they're not there. But there is a lot about, about harmony. There is a lot about dealing with the contradictions in trying to love another person. There, there's a lot of great value, but it is kind of a, a different book. And, and yes, in the council that decided it was part of the canon, they decreed that it was an allegory of God's love for his people. And who am I to argue with a bunch of bishops. <laughs> I would never do that, would oh, I? Oh, yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Yes. Another way that it's read is also an allegory of, of the love of God for the individual soul. Not only the love between, you know, a people and God, but just, you know, if you read that, like, you can read it as this God is saying this to you personally. And theologians who have um, written about it have also recommended that it should not be read except for people in a more advanced <laughs> state. So they don't read it just for the, you know, at the corporal <laughs> level, you know, that they read it spiritually. <laughs> right. Um, at the time that it was written, 2nd, 3rd century BCE, that individual relationship seems somewhat unlikely. It was really a time of, of thinking about the relationship between God and community. Now, that doesn't mean that it isn't valuable to read it with the other idea in mind. Uh, I think, well, Reminds me of one of the things that I intended to say much earlier in this, but one of the things that we find from reading this, this work of 2,500 years ago is how much the same people are. Mm -hmm. You know, we sometimes get this idea that, you know, we've advanced so much. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. It's it's the same. It's the same pain. It's that same feeling of aloneness. It's that same feeling like you deserve something that you're not getting. Yeah. That we see 2,500 years ago. Wisdom, the book of wisdom, sometimes called the wisdom of Solomon, not because it was written by Solomon, but just because he was a wise guy, oh no, not a wise guy, that <laughs> <laughs> did not come out right. Um, it's not part of the standard Hebrew canon, it's not part of the standard Protestant Bible. It, it is a part of the Catholic Bible, and Episcopalians sort of split the difference and <laughs> stick it in the Apocrypha, um, which we use for edification but not for doctrine. It was certainly known to the New Testament writers. There are quotes from it. Um, there are some very interesting, it, it's quite recent, as you can see, first century BC. Um, it's sort of the most striking place, not the only place, but the most striking place that we see the personification of wisdom, the Santa Sophia, the holy wisdom as a female being. This developed in later Jewish theology actually into a co-eternal belief in wisdom, uh, even a belief that creation, that God created the universe through <coughs> wisdom. Um, but that's, that's later that this book was written. Um, Wisdom is bright and unfading. She is readily, she readily appears to those who love her. She is found by those who keep seeking after her. There are many very nice quotes for us academics in the book of wisdom. Um, but you can see, I mean, that again, we're getting some of these same ideas in the wisdom literature of the others. Of, of loving righteousness. This one, I, I found this one interesting because it, it's directed more at the uh, at the upper middle class, not the kings, not the people. We need to be judges of the earth. Well, that was. We might want to take some of those sayings to heart. Um, Then we have Ecclesiasticus, also <coughs> canon, full of sayings and social graces, has many good things to say about wine. Uh, <laughs> so I read it often. Uh, <laughs> Ecclesiasticus means the book of the church, uh, because at the time when the when the church adopted it, it was not part of the Jewish canon, and it was adopted by the church and really said, this is, this is our, our book. Um, and again, we have very strongly the identification of wisdom with the fear of the Lord. Very sympathetic to the poor. <laughs> not so much to women. Uh, yeah, women and slaves don't make out so well in Ecclesiasticus. But, all right, so those are the seven wisdom books. The timing, as, as we notice, they're all post-exile. Before the exile, the Jewish people identified themselves as a nation. 
a kingdom of people. We got a king eventually. I mean, at first they didn't have a king. At first they were really more unusual in, in the area for not having a king. They had judges. They were a self-ruled people. But they didn't like that. They wanted to be like everyone else and have a king. So then they were a kingdom. And that provides an identification. It's a political and ethnic identification. Well, the, the exile to Babylon kind of fouled that one up. You know, how can you identify yourself as a kingdom after you've been conquered? Well, they didn't. They didn't assimilate. There are several books we could talk about where we just went to show how much they didn't assimilate, but they had to re-identify themselves. They had to identify themselves as a religious people. Most of the Old Testament was written or collected during this time period after the return. Now, if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you, you hear the story of finding the Torah, finding the book of the law, and reading it to the, the whole nation. But the rest of the Old Testament is mostly put together in this time period. And there are a lot of ideas that we didn't see before that came from that exposure to what really was kind of a, a world empire. I mean, it spanned a lot of peoples with a lot of ideas and um, really introduced a lot of new thought. <coughs> now, okay, why, why did I think that wisdom literature had anything to say to us today? Because I see our society as going through some of the same turmoil of trying to trying to redefine ourselves. For a long time, Western civilization has sort of identified itself as, well, we don't just follow other cultures and borrow from them. No, we chase them down alleys, beat them up, and steal all their ideas. <laughs> Um, but as we kind of become more multicultural, more accepting of different, different ways of looking at how people fit into the world, more multicultural, then we kind of have to identify ourselves in a different way, identify ourselves as a community of ideas. And that's what the people of Israel had to do after exile. They identified themselves <clears throat> as a people of the law, as a people of the covenant, as a people of a way of life, as a people of ideas. Now, there's other non-biblical wisdom mm -hmm. writing. Um, it was actually a... <laughs> it was one of the ideas that came back from the exile. It was an exposure to the wisdom writing in the Near East. Um, the Stoics, certainly qualify, and there are some modern ones. Omar Khayyam is could easily... Oh, he was a poet, he was a philosopher, he was a mathematician, he was a wisdom writer. He was a wine connoisseur. A great guy all around! Um, but if you, if you look at at some of these ideas that you see in his poetry. Be happy for this moment. This moment is your life. Okay? It's looking at some of those same questions of 
of how do we how do we live our life in a world that seems random? In a in a world that where things seem incomprehensible and, and sometimes futile. Another name that might be familiar. <laughs> Much later. I mean, what? It was 400 years later, right? The last of the good emperors. I, I like the first quote there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the idea of the virtuous life as defined by tradition. And okay, some of, some of his tradition we might not be so comfortable with. What a sweet and pleasant thing it is to die for one's country. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd rather not. But <laughs> <laughs> Much more modern, C.S. Lewis, Problem of Pain. You're not high school dropouts, so you guys can read this. Uh, I, I don't have to. But that's kind of, of a restating of one of the main themes in the, liter the wisdom literature of reconciling human suffering with, with a just God. Mm -hmm. And then a, another modern writer, maybe not as familiar, Norman Pittenger, um, a theologian, wrote a book called Life is Eucharist, um, where he explores life, human life as being properly properly lived in a context of community, um, a context of, of social awareness and social justice. Um, he didn't have any very good quotes. I, I thought of <laughs> his sentences tend to be long. His, uh, his partner was W.H. Auden, oh. who has very short Non-sentences. Um, <coughs> but, all right, so, I, I don't think the wisdom literature gives us answers as much as it gives us questions. It gives us challenges. It gives us the, the basic challenges of, of how do we create a community? How do we identify ourselves as the body of Christ in a multicultural society? Identifying ourselves without separating ourselves. Ah, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. What does it mean for us to be that community in the world? And then... You know, we live in this era of big data. Well, that means a lot of things, but, but what's data? Uh, just a bunch of numbers. Who cares about numbers, right? Until it becomes information, it's just data. Until the information gets processed into facts, it's just some information. The facts... That's what you scientists do, right? You take those facts and, and you try to get knowledge from the facts. And I think we're a whole lot better at getting knowledge than we are at getting wisdom. But I think that that's the, uh, that's the last step in that process of data to information to facts to knowledge to wisdom. And yes, there's another slide that I've forgotten about. Um, that would be it. So, thank you.
50 minutes and stop and ask any any questions. It's just what we're trained to do. So, yeah. Question. Yes. I have a comment, question. Um, I think there was as you were pointing out, at those times of post-exilic period, maybe there was some absorption of different ideas and cultures. But at the same time, there are strictures even in some of those writings against absorbing too much. I mean, oh, yes. I mean, well, I don't know, like, the only thing that comes to mind, I guess, is the Book of Maccabees, that's the Catholic Bible again, where it warns me against being too much like the Greeks with the stadiums and, you know, and warnings about what, you know, is eaten mm -hmm. and all that. So... And, and I think I, and I think to, to define ourselves even as Christians, even so today, there's there's still can be those questions and problems. What what where do we what are the strictures and what do we set up? You know, to separate ourselves. Or and I think that was part of the redefining of themselves, rather than separated because they were a kingdom in this particular area, they were separated by ideas, by ideas. and by their relationship with God through the Law and the Covenants. And so, yes, that those rules for separation are very much a part of that whole process. I guess when I looked at what we're trying to do now of identifying ourselves as the body of Christ within a society, I don't see that separating and standing back from the world as being what I think of as a healthy approach now. I, I think it's a, I think that post-resurrection we're called to a different relationship with the world. Well, now you're talking about the exile. Is this the same as the exodus? No, 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 much okay. later. Exile to Babylon. To exile to Babylon. Yeah. All right, Joe will have to tell me about it. Yeah, okay. after. Right. Um, you know, Exodus is, is really the, the prehistory before the, the, is, the Israelites moved into the Promised Land. And then they established their kingdom and were there for hundreds of years, a millennia. And then in about five, five I was going to say about 600, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm an applied mathematician. Exactly. One significant figure is all I know. Uh, so in 586 BCE, that's when they were conquered. The temple was destroyed. The walls of Jerusalem were knocked down. They were hauled off into exile. To Babylon? To Babylon. Where was Babylon? Uh, basically, where a rock is, yeah. pretty close to where Baghdad is. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now and then Daniel tells you about how he got along during exile, and so, so basically they were they were you know political slaves in Babylon for fifty years, and then they were allowed to return and reestablish the temple and so on, but not a kingdom. Not a kingdom. Vassal state, but, but really left for Yes, Bill, you stated that from a Christian perspective about trying to reestablish who we are. Do you think that today there are other religions, Judaism, Islam, that are also trying to do the same thing? Yes. Uh, I think there are. I think in all three of those Abrahamic religions, you also have branches that are not. But I think you have a majority of those religions where people are struggling with how to maintain their identity without, without having an enemy to focus on. For too much of the world's history, we've defined ourselves as against. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're seeing that right now with the Soviet, the former Soviet Union, is having a hard time defining itself without having someone to be against. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that wisdom, not knowledge and information and data, 
but wisdom could in any way be some kind of a common denominator for all of us, those who are trying to have a redefinition of who they are in a life-affirming kind of way? Well, I think the wisdom literature is about asking those questions. I think it is really asking the kinds of questions we need to be asking. And I think that when we, when we look at kind of the more fanatical branches of the various religions, they don't like the wisdom literature. They, they like the legalistic parts because that gives them answers. Wisdom literature doesn't give you answers. Wisdom literature gives you questions. Uh, I'll, I'll just add to Bill's response there that uh, you know a lot of the there's really two very strong strains in the literature Jewish literature from this period right and one says you have to keep yourself completely apart from foreigners you have to follow these very strict dietary laws all these rules are the really important things that identify who you are and the religion the the uh, uh, wisdom literature is very different than that, right? It makes almost no reference to those sorts of things. It says, you know, you have to try and find out what God wants you to do, but it's not defined in terms of rigid rules and laws and separateness from other people. So, And it's not defined in terms of what somebody else does. That's right. It's term, defined in terms of what you do, which is mm. real different. <laughs> if, if one were to... Um, uh, examine the, the Quran or, or um, some Buddhist literature or something, could you not find wisdom literature in, in those? Oh, heavens yes. Um, the probably um, well, most of Buddhist literature as such as it is would probably qualify as wisdom literature. Mm -hmm. The Quran maybe not the the Quran itself, as much as later writings, but if you look at the at the sort of late golden age, and and a little bit after that for the Islamic world, um, you're going to find those same kinds of questions being so, examined. So, so if if you made those analysis, would you find conflict? Or would they merge into a into a single well, unit search of, uh, uh, again? It, yeah, it's a search. You see, it, it's it's hard to get conflict when we don't get the answers, <laughs> right? We just get the questions. Um, but no, I don't think you. I don't think you would see the conflict there. I think you would see how universal this kind of cry for reason in a sometimes unreasonable world is. And it's just the time periods, it's, it's hard to be introspective when things are going great. You know, when, when Solomon's on his throne and <coughs> the people of the <coughs> Isles bring tribute, well then, you know, why are you going to question the, your basic assumptions about life? Things are good. But when you've been hauled off into slavery and you've now been allowed to come back, but you had to get permission from the local governor to rebuild the walls, and there were limits on how high you could build them, and it, you know, it, it brings to mind, it brings questions. It brings just all those things about, well, is this a rational world or isn't it? Because if it's not a rational world, it doesn't seem to make any sense. But if it is a rational world, then why aren't things working the way they are? <laughs> yeah. Okay, why don't we call it off there for the moment, and we can reconvene at quarter after, and uh, have a little informal discussion.